Well, good morning, everyone. Ed Marshall uh, with KPMG Director and Federal Advisory. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, so I retired in September, decided to join KPMG uh, very uh, because I wanted to contribute to a bigger cause, much like my military service. So I retired in September as the vice commander out at Space Launch Delta 45 uh, out at Patrick. So 13 of my 26 years has been in space. I've done space acquisitions, launch, and uh, got my headquarters assignment to uh, right down the road here in Colorado Springs. So uh, with that, I have the pleasure of moderating Major General Steve Whitney. He is the Military Deputy Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisitions and Integration, Washington, DC. He's responsible for research and development, test, production, product support, and modernization of Space Force programs worth more than $24 billion annually. His responsibilities include crafting program strategies and options for representing DAF positions to the Office of Secretary of Defense, Congress, and the White House. General Whitney graduated in 1992 from the University of Minnesota with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and was a distinguished graduate from the university's Air Force ROTC program. He has served in a wide variety of space systems acquisition and operation leadership positions within the Air and Space Force, Joint Staff, Office of the Secretary of Defense, and the National Reconnaissance Office. His assignments include serving as a crew commander, spacecraft engineer, senior flight commander, program element monitor, director of engineering, squadron commander, senior material leader, program director, and program executive officer. Welcome, General Whitney. Hey, uh, it's so good to see you. Uh, Rock, good to see you again, Chief Frazier. Chief, how you doing? Uh, exciting to see you all, to be here. Uh, wow. I thought I was, you know, doing well until Ed starts off with class of '92. That means I'm the old guy, right? What he didn't, what he didn't say in there is uh, six-time Pentagon veteran, right? I've got all the funky little things that you hand out at the Pentagon. I've done tours on, and, and as he mentioned, OST and Joint Staff puts me in a strange position. I've also done ops and acquisition. So as we talk about this culture and, and we talk about where we go and how we blend things together, the ability to go back and forth and have the conversation is kind of where I want to take our, our talk today. I'd be remiss if I didn't start off by thanking NSA and KPMG for hosting today. I'm really excited. I do want to ad lib for just a second and talk about my why. Right? Why did I choose to, to turn over to the Space Force? Um, part of it was a, jokingly, right, I, I like many others had the opportunity and I, I took a moment when that form came across my desk and it said I volunteered to resign my commission. And I went, uh, uh, is this what I'm doing? Um, for me, it was a little more scary because it was already signed by the secretary. So I'm like, is this a message? Uh, no, seriously, I, at, the point, at the point I transitioned, I was, uh, at the time I did that, I was 27 years in, had, had a great career, had been doing lots of good things. But why I decided to do it was it's about setting up something new. I've been passionate about space. I've been passionate about delivering capabilities for our nation. But here was an opportunity to, to really set up this new thing, the Space Force, to help, in, I won't say infect, but help grow and, and, and train young leaders to take over. I know that my career short line is far shorter than many of you in this, in this room, and I just want to be there to help set the blocks to get you going and help get you going in the right direction, right? And, and so that's kind of why I'm here today is to talk about that. All right. So it's a historic time for our United States, right? Uh, 2019 is, is, is an interesting, interesting time. You know the, the, the narratives of how we got here. There's two main narratives on why we went the directions we did. The first narrative is all about the threat and the, the ever-evolving what's going on in orbital warfare and, 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 and out there on orbit. I'm going to save that for Brock to talk about because he's probably more steeped in that than I am. I'm going to tell you about the second narrative. It's politics. It's the DC conversation. It's about the money. Uh, many of us have worked in the Pentagon before, and you're, some of us worked in the same office. We remember we had a boss that had 10 rules for decisions in the Pentagon. Rule one was it's about the money. Rule two is I don't care what they tell you, it's about the money. 
I don't remember the others, but rule seven was no, no, it's really about the money. Um, and so those, those drove two conversations and, and those two narratives actually ended up driving us towards the same place. And so there were, there were two major sets of actions that were taken in order to make that happen. Uh, the first came about early in 2019 with the, the return of U.S. Space Command and the, and the Unified Command Plan. Um, it's important to note that that happened first. And then the second big action was the FY20 NDAA, which had three big things. Uh, first off, it obviously it created the United States Space Force, huge, huge step that we talked about for years and finally did that. It also created a new office in OSD. Yeah, those, those, those bureaucrats that sit there to talk about policy, but specifically dedicated at space policy to help us work through the big issues. First time that had been elevated. And then it did something that is unique in our federal government. And that's where most of my comments and my talk today will probably focus on. It established a second service acquisition executive. So nowhere else in the federal government, not in commerce, not in agriculture or interior, anywhere, are there two people that have final acquisition say. The Department of the Air Force is the only place in the federal government that has two people that can have final acquisition say. Not even the Department of the Navy. The Marines all fall under the Navy acquisition executive. But space has its own. Now, that really is driven partly by this second narrative of, of dollars and control, right? But it presents us a huge opportunity as we go forward, right? Now we have a politically appointed Senate confirmed Assistant Secretary of the Air Force who has nothing to do but focus on space acquisition. In some of my previous tour tours when I was in the Air Force acquisition, the broader acquisition, you'd go in to see the acquisition executive and you'd have to fight for time amongst the F-35, the KC-46, the range, whatever, various systems, and quite often you'd get half an hour once a week. Now we've got a full-time executive with all the authorities and the power to, to do nothing but that, right? To focus on nothing but space, and that's a huge opportunity for us. It also means that we should take a look at how we go about it. And so how do we go about space acquisition and what culture do we want to create as we do that, right? We don't have to do it the way it's always been done but we have to do it in a way that delivers on our commitments and meets our, meets our well, essentially what we have promised that we would deliver, right? I think Secretary Calvelli has, has established his expectations. If you've had a chance, back in October, he published what's famously known as the nine tenets. And then in April, he followed up with it, what he called a simple formula for going fast in space acquisition. Uh, if you haven't a chance to read those, I, I encourage you to do so. I'm not going to spend time. But, but they are really about this culture piece, about how do we get after a culture of, of delivering capabilities. And there's one thing at the last of his nine tenets that really sets us up. And it's about delivering, right? Delivering your capabilities on cost, on schedule. And to do that requires what he refers to oftentimes as program management discipline. And so... That program management discipline applies whether you're in the government side or industry. It doesn't matter. It's, it's about how do you say I'm going to do something, here's how you're going to measure me, and then I'm going to deliver on it, right? For our acquisition side, it's, it's making sure that we understand and we have the capabilities to know cost, to know schedule, to know performance, to know the risk, to know the trades in between, to know how to, when something happens deep in the supply chain, what that's going to cause later down the line. Right, to have those conversations, to, to ha understand a, a mo what motivates both sides in the acquisition contract piece, right? The program management side on the government is, is highly motivated by delivery and, and doing so on time, on budget. So is the contractor. There are other motivations in there that may be driving things. And the more the two sides can talk, the better off we're going to be. So as we look forward, this opportunity requires us to take some time and talk about talent development. And what does it mean to develop the talent we need, right, for our Space Force, for our country to be able to deliver, right? I know in the Space Force we talk a lot about capabilities such as orbital warfare, or electronic warfare, or space access, mobility, and logistics. But there's also acquisition in there, right? And, and so the question of is it operations, is it acquisition, they're not separate. They can't be separate. They've got to exist to work for each other. And so within the acquisition career field, I, I talk a lot about, as, as the functional authority, I talk a lot about what are the knowledge, skills, and attributes that I need of folks, right? And so, yeah, I want people to understand how the user is going to use the system. I, yeah, I want them to understand how orbital warfare works. I want them to understand 
mechanics of you know orbits and so forth. But I also need them to be able to understand how the acquisition process works, how to get through a milestone A, and what does that mean? How to do tech readiness? How to do a program a, a preliminary design review, a critical design review? How to do a source selection? That's those are critical skills that we all need on the acquisition side, and those take times. The biggest challenge we have on the acquisition community is fitting all this in, right? Getting all this in to get the, lack of better words, the reps and sets to be able to, to build the program directors or the program managers that we need, right? If we spend all our time um, on just one piece, right? You know, in my typical career, I spent my first tour as an operator out at Schriever, and then I went to the program office for a couple of years, and I worked on basically uh, pre-preliminary design review of, of, of programs for two years, and that's all I saw, right? So that's, that's the only reps I got, right? How do I get, how do we get people with reps and sets on, on, on the entire thing? And some of that is going faster, and some of that is, is following Honorable Calvelli's formula for going faster. Some of that is making sure we expose people. But another part of it is the culture we set, and the culture that we set in the organization, and how do we develop as a learning organization, all right? And, and and I often talk about learning organizations, right, are ones that take the time and, and, and do thing, little things like feedback. And I'm not talking for, for the military folks, the Form 724, throw it away. I'm talking about you get done with the meeting and you close the door and say, okay, how'd it go? What went wrong? What went right? What do we got to work on? And make sure you hit all three of those, right? Because we'll focus too much on what went wrong and we'll dissect it. We take the time to talk about what went right as well. But do that feedback. Have those conversations. They can be as simple as having a conversation when you're walking back from a meeting. Okay, my, my arena, walking across the Pentagon following a meeting, right? Okay, so what'd you think? How'd you do? How What'd you think of what so-and-so said? What did you learn from that, right? To the younger crowd, I, I, would, I would offer this thought. When you sit in a meeting with your senior leaders, I'd, I'd challenge you to do two things. Number one, think about what you would be doing if you were in their shoes. How would you answer this? How would you attack the problem? Because if they're smart, they're going to call on you. And they'll probably call on you on, an, on a weird spot in the middle of the meeting and catch you off guard, so you better be ready for it. But second, just because it's not your area of expertise doesn't mean it's time for pencils down and time to check, mind check out and start dreaming about where I'm going this weekend on vacation or whatever. Now's the time to really step in and take notes, right, to, to learn and see what else you can get. There's probably somebody in your office that couldn't be there that needed to be there for that point. You probably need to be what I call the living JADC2 and be that sensor for them and, and, and go back and share. At the end of the day, talent development, learning organizations, it's a leadership challenge. But it doesn't mean it's a leadership challenge for General Leonard or myself just because we have the stars. That's a leadership challenge for each and every one of us. right? Whether you are the person in charge or you're the person preparing the slides or whatever, you have the opportunity and, and we need you to step up. And so as we talk about things today, I, I return to uh, the original question that uh, Ms. Vaughn posed of why are you here? How do we go forward? How do we take advantage of this opportunity to set up the Space Force, not that we want, but the one we need? And maybe, maybe it is the one we want, but how do we drive it forward and how do we do so in a, in a learning environment such that mistakes are not things that we shoot, but are things that we have conversations about and grow from? So with that, I look forward to the questions. Um, I was told, Ed, that I think we have extra time thanks to the chief going short. So I apologize up front for that. So, <laughs> Thank you, sir. So General Whitney did want this to be interactive. Uh, so I've got two prepared questions. Then we'll open it up to the audience. And if y'all don't have any more, I've got some more questions. So uh, please use this time to uh, sync and get as much information out of General Whitney as possible. So, uh, sir, would your current position, you're working with Mr. Cavelli uh, side by side, you are one team. And so wanted to get your view and his on the warfighting culture and establishing that ethos uh, both within the acquisition career field and going bigger into the Space Force. Okay, is this on? Okay. Um, so I would say first and foremost, right, uh, the culture we're trying to establish supports our warfighting ethos. I don't know that there is such a thing as an acquisition warfighting ethos, but it is all about 
understanding why we're going after things and why they need to be delivered, and having honest conversations about the capabilities that we're delivering. So yes, we, there are many things that we need to go fast on, and we need to get out there, and we need to get kit in the capabilities hands. And there are other things that we need to be assured on and just keep delivering. So I'll, I'll pick on, for, in that latter category, my beloved GPS. I spent six years at the program office as the GPS Spo director. Trust me, I bleed green monster all the time. But I would say that that's probably one that we just need to keep and stay steady state for a while where we focus on the other pieces, right? We can't ask the organization to focus on everything all at once, right? The, the, the line from The Incredibles, if everybody's special, then nobody else, right? And so let's focus on the, the, the things that we need to get done to get the kit and the capabilities of the hands. And so I would say that Honorable Cavalli and his tenants and what he talks about there and trying to make sure acquisition delivers and is stable and does so at a, at a pace is all about that ethos, if you will, of making sure the capability is available. All right. Thank you, sir. Next one, sir. You've had multiple assignments uh, throughout. Um, every location has different cultures. And so how do you merge the cultures of Space Development Agency, Space Rapids Capability Office, Space Systems Command, and to some extent, some of the NRO functions as well? So how do you merge those, sir? So uh, a couple of thoughts, and, and I had asked Ed to add uh, the NRO to that question specifically because I want to talk about that. Oftentimes when we talk about things in the, in the Beltway world, there's a, a third rail there about space with the NRO and making sure that IC connection and IC is there. But we definitely need to make sure that there are skills and attributes that we need to share amongst our people to go back and forth. So each of those organizations exist for very specific reasons and how they go about things, right? So let's just take a quick wander through. Space Systems Command is your traditional, hey, how do I build basically everything that's out there? And how do I ensure that it's got the A sub zero, that it's always on and always going to work? And how do I make sure da, 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 da. Space RCO is about delivering a kit that is rapidly needed, that isn't necessarily checked out to the nth degree, that is just get something up there to give me an option, right? And, and, and then we'll get it into a longer term program of record where it has the A sub O and all the illities that go with it. Um, Space Development Agency is primarily focused on the proliferated architecture and the ability to take advantage of what I call the revolutionary in spacecraft industry, right? For years, spacecraft development was all about how do I build this one satellite? I spend a lot of time on it. I make sure it's precise. I've mapped everything out, da 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 da. What we've seen in this revolution is we've almost gone to the Model T approach, right? We're in that kind of same stage. How do I get through it fast and at scale, right? And how do I make sure that the tolerances are good enough to connect? Or how do I mass produce these things, right? I used to, as the GPS director, be able to tout that I had the biggest production line because I had, you know, 30 satellites on orbit. I was pretty, pretty awesome. But nowadays you're seeing companies like SpaceX who are churning that out on a single launch. And so, that revolution, how do we take advantage of that? And that's really what SDA was designed to capture, to go after a very specific mission, mission set of missile warning, missile track, because they're lowering the altitude, and that gives you some different geometries as you look at things. And then the NRO is traditionally a, the intelligence collection agency. Um, they've gone through a revolution in their own development. You can talk to them as you like. They've, they have both the big scale programs that we all know and love, and they've gone into many smaller programs that they're trying to take advantage of that proliferation. But they're very focused on that Intel collect mentality. So as I would answer the question, right, how do you how do you blend those cultures? I don't know that I want to blend those cultures into one as much as I want them to exist. But what I want in terms of talent development is I want to take individuals and I want to put them through different parts of each organization to learn the lessons, to learn the capabilities. Why did they do it one way in one organization and another way in another? We all follow the same statutes. We all follow the same rules. But why is one, what, what shortcuts is one taking that the other hasn't? And what's the risk in doing so? And what's the benefit? And then move on to your next assignment and take some of those lessons and start working them in, right? And eventually you'll see cultures kind of move but the cultures will still remain some, but they'll move closer together. But that's, to me, development and where we go. What I don't want to see, Steve's, Steve's personal desire is, I don't want to see Chief Fraser go to one office as a, as a young 
young PM and never leave, right? If they, if, if he was to go to just SDA and spend his entire time there or just SSC and spend his entire time there, that's not development. That's just repetition, right? But I want, I want to get the different sets in to get to give them the experiences. Thanks, sir. So we'll open it up. Yes, sir. So I've got a couple different thoughts on, on, on that in regards. And I don't know what the video camera is and if it's going to follow me as I wander because I, I tend to walk. I can't stand still. Um, part of that stalling so I can come up with answers and questions. <clears throat> yep. Mm -hmm. I, definitely, and, and I, th I think we're struggling to understand what it means so long, for so many years, we have done tests, if you will, in terms of checking out the satellite and making sure it does its capabilities. But we haven't done tests in terms of an orbital or a, in terms of a constellation-wide capability, or, or we haven't done tests of, hey, what do we do in, in different situations? Um, and so that's an interesting challenge. I don't know if it fits well with the first question in terms of acquisition mindsets and different culture centers. I almost look at Starcom as, as, as somebody that's on the outside of the development cycle that needs to be interfaced and that people need to go in and out of and from those development centers, I agree. But I don't look at them as a, a PM skills, if you will, as much as I do uh, somebody that helps us get the capability delivered, if that makes sense at all. Um, I don't know, thoughts? Where, where does that fit with where you were at? So as a test pilot school grad, spent a lot of time on the air side. Mm -hmm. the, to me, the the synergy of your test community being with your choir has to be from beginning to end, right? And, and I see the space, you know, Space Force is walking down that path for the integrated test. Uh, so I, I don't, personally, I don't see them as, as we move forward in the future to, to separate. Because it's the, it's the integration role that you've got that the testers have a broader view of just your singular one. They, have the, they should be able to bring in the broader view of how do you integrate into the whole for the enterprise. I, I, I could get behind that very easily. Um, I would say that in the past on the space side, our, our, our role has not been as tight as on the air side as in terms of tests. Because there's a lot of questions, what does it mean to test a satellite and, and so forth. And, and oh, by the way, um, I'll tell you, as, as we started one of our GPS satellite competitions, when Air Force test agency stood up and said, no, you got to buy me two satellites for testing. I'm like, uh-uh. Not at, not at $280 million a copy, uh-uh. I don't have that budget, right? And, and so we had, we had, that was a, more the fight. And so how do we, how do we take the constraints we're in now and, and, and work towards that future? That'd be the real question. No, Mandy, you can't ask questions. Fine. But no, I guess I'll, I'll still say thank you for coming and spending the day with us because I think this is a fascinating perspective. So one question I have for you, um, and you mentioned being in the program office where all you did was like two years on a, on a PDR. And those sorts of monster SPO jobs, I always refer to them as lieutenant killer kind of kind of jobs, right? So kind of to that point, so Calvelli talks about going fast, and he's got his tenants to try to go fast. Um, I think one thing I wrestle with is we also talk about commercial integration. How do we talk more about leveraging the, the innovative ecosystem, these commercial companies, a more distributed industrial base that's new and emerging? Uh, how do you... I kind of view that as a way that we can go faster as well as a way that we can have a larger, more diverse and disparate team that's supporting not only delivering the capability, but then providing the acquisition professionals all kinds of different stuff to do. So what are your thoughts on that and how can we start to maybe more meaningfully break up those monolithic lieutenant killer acquisition behemoths into something that can be faster and really more more proliferated. And I don't mean that in the SD, SDA sense of proliferated. Right. No, I got you. Um, a couple of thoughts real quickly on commercial I want to make sure I get out. First off, there is nothing in our policies that prohibits us from going to commercial. Matter of fact, our policies, if you read our acquisition Bible known as the DoD 5000, it starts off with prove to us that a commercial capability doesn't meet this need, right? 
And so part of the conversation we need to have as we cross this culture around the services is when we set the requirements, how do we set requirements that are capable where a commercial solution is, is acceptable, right? Um, and, and part of that is the conversation of knowing what's out there and what's back. Part of that is incentivizing program managers for delivering the capability, not delivering the program a record. And I think there's been a lot of push that way, but we've got a lot more to go. And part of that is the culture and risk, if you will, right? Risk, trust, if you will. I, I, I like those as two things. To how do we convince them that it's okay, right? I will tell you, as the GPS SPO director, I was incentivized to deliver, you know, GPS 3, OCX, while well, I failed, um, user equipment, right? It was, I would, that's what I was incentivized, not come up with an alternate PNT method. Not, not go invest $30 million a year in NTS3, what we did, but, right? And so, but deliver the actual programs a record. Um, and so we've got to get into a culture where that's what we reward as well. I think General Gutlein has pushed really hard on that. You're probably all familiar with his, his, his statement, right? Buy what we can, right? I always forget the second one, Willie. Ex exploit, what, or exploit what we have, buy what we can, and then, and then build what we must. But what people often miss in that is there's a word that I just dropped intentionally because I want to point this out. He says it very specifically. It's not build what we must. It's build only what we must. It's a different way of thinking about it. It's a culture piece that, that, that he's been trying to push, and I agree with, right? right? Exploit what's there, buy what, what already exists, and then if I have to, build something, not build it because I, I feel it's necessary. So I think, that, I think we're pushing that direction. I think we've got a long ways to go, though. So. Yep. Thanks, Elsie. Uh, I've got lots of different thoughts. I, I think first and foremost, it comes back to how we, how we deal with it when it happens, and how do we deal with it? Um, how do we plan to deal with it? Right. So I'm going to take two stories, personal war stories, from my operational time. Right. As a young lieutenant, I was a DSP squadron, you know, DSP at one stops. We were flying that, and we were flying. Had a critical mission in the middle of the night, New Year's Eve to turn off the. This, the circulation pump on the infrared, or the coolant on the infrared telescope. And so it was important because the satellite was coming around the orbit and was getting to the point where the sun was going to be looking down the barrel. And so you didn't want the coolant circulating to actually circulate heat onto the focal plane. At the same time that was happening, we were getting a call from, a, from an overseas ground station, we'll just say, and, and they couldn't find another satellite. And so as a young crew commander, young second lieutenant, I thought I was the world, right? And we are trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And so we are trying to set up an emergency support on that other satellite. And that satellite had actually, what it had done is the attitude control system had failed and it had walked its way off of earth lock. And so it was just kind of tumbling. Now at the time I was studying to be the, the lead for the upcoming DSP launch. And so I understood better than anyone, my own opinion, right? Um, what happens to a satellite when it tumbles and what does it look like and what characteristics should we look at? So we're actually sitting at Shriver in the squadron, and we're on two separate sides of the council, of the cubicle consoles. And the team doing the recovery mission is on the other side, and I'm supposed to be running this one on. And I'm shouting at them instructions, like, oh, I can't find this. Look here, look there, look here, da 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 And I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. And so I go up, I take my state of health, I write it down, blah, 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 blah. I crush the time. I turn to my, my airman and said, hey, we got the time? Yep, we're done. Click, boom, we're down. We were down for about 30 seconds before that phone rang from from Buckley said, hey, uh, you forgot to turn the thing off. Okay. So I went back in. I scored that support, my support. I failed, failed to send required command. Went to the review board, right? Never, 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 see, an, never see an operator in uniform, right? It's never a good sign. Um, went to the review board, and they're like, what happened? Was it your training? Was it this? Was it that? Ah, I screwed up. I was too busy focused on what, it, what I was supposed to, was, you know, what was going on than what, what I was supposed to be doing. My commander at the time, said, I think he's learned his lesson. And we talked about that a lot. 
And he said, okay, pat me on my back and push me on my way. That was his investment in my development. Okay? A couple years later, I'm still in the same squadron. I have a different commander. And I'm now the engineer in charge of the DSP satellites. And we're coming into eclipse season. And I give, we had one satellite. We were having a wonky time with batteries. It was, we were doing weird things. And I had given them explicit commands. At this time, send this command. At this time, send this command. Dot, 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 dot. And it's, the crew failed. They, they, they didn't send it, right? And so their, their response was, well, the, the checklist was bad. And so I walked in the next day, and, and my commander had an Article 15 with my name on it. And that was his response. As a culture goes, those are two different ways to deal with problems, right? In both cases, there were investments in, a, in, in, in the officers, in the, in the people on the crew. In both cases, they set their mindset for how this unit was going to be, all right? In both cases, to be perfectly honest, nothing happened to the satellites, thank God, right? We, we were able to fix things fairly quickly, and, and, and they moved on. But those are opportunities as leaders we need to take advantage of to teach our folks, right? I think the, the weapons school folks that have done that and understand the debrief process for a mission, right? We should do the same in the things that we do, right? That feedback session I'm talking about, as you come out of a meeting, as you come out of an event, hey, how'd it go? What'd you think of this? Where was this at? What were you thinking when so-and-so said this? How did, what, where was your head at, right? Did you catch this, right? Um, those are the conversations that matter more than sitting down once a year in a 724 and going, yep, you're meeting the standards, you're meeting the standards, right? If you do that, and, and, and that type of leadership that I'm talking about, that can be done at any level, from the lowest one striper up to the, the, the four star, right? It's just taking the time to do it. Ask for it. Sit down with your team as, as you come out of it and ask for it, right? Have those investments. Um, and, and that's kind of what I think of LC when I think about investments. I think I answered your question. I'm going to go back and ask if I did or not because I got, I, got, I got off on war stories and started having fun. So. I think, I think we got to be willing to share our stories, just just like that, that, to prove that it's not a failure. Um, one of my greatest frustrations as the SPO commander, right, as the SPO director for GPS, was not the problems that were happening in the programs. It was when my lieutenants would come up to me and go, "Hey, sir, I've decided I'm getting out at three years. My first OPR, I didn't get a strat." And I go, "Huh? Well, I'm obviously not going to get promoted to lieutenant colonel because I didn't get a strat in my first OPR." So I pull out my reports and it was I was coming up for major before I had my first one and, and we have this conversation about what does that mean and hey this is a feedback form this is a conversation about your performance if that's your goal how do you go about it right but I think LC it's it's the willingness to have the conversations and 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 we've got to sponsor a culture that supports the ability to have those conversations. Okay. All right Gene's hiding back there with a the microphone. Oh, thank you. So my, my former cubicle mate. <laughs> uh, so acquisition training, that's kind of my question area. Back when I went to, came out of ops and went to acquisition in 1998, I went to training down at Lackland for four weeks. It was Air Force. And we talked a lot about baskets, bows, and big different acquisitions. And I'd ask my question like, well, okay, but I'm in a satellite program office and how does this actually relate? And I learned a ton anyway, but it was always, well, space is a little bit different. Of course, now here we are in Space Force. You're our, our senior uniformed Space Force headquarters uh, acquisition uh, guardian. So that's a big deal. Yeah, when, did I, that, when did that happen? I knew you when. I knew you when. Okay. Um, but what would you say is the current state of uh, acquisition training, is there going to be a Space Force specific or space? Because it seems just from what we've been, what I've been observing, the folks out at SSC and other places are doing a, a lot of neat new acquisition or creative acquisition approaches, but that's not going to be covered if they go over to Wright Pat and, and, and get no. that. Can you talk to like maybe the current 
and pro projected or m maybe what you would think would be um, achievable or ideal for space acquisition guardian? Training? Okay, thanks, Gene. Um, so yeah, I too have sat through all those defense acquisition university courses. Um, I completed my last one in 2008 and I've only been back a couple of times, but um, I would tell you that those are good for foundational and understanding the basics of the broader system, but the, the specifics you talk about of, of, of understanding satellites and what does a PDR mean or what does it mean to run through a clean room or, right? And, and why do I have to have a certain level uh, clean room for, for different things? Why do I have to, why do I worry about tungsten in space, right? And, and why do I worry about lithium ion batteries? And, and those are things that come through experience, to be honest, in some regards. And so some of that is the reps and sets that we talk about. Um, some of that, though, is how do we take advantage of, I'm going to call them gray beards because they're older than me, uh, folks that have, have those experiences, right? The scar tissues that we develop, right, through running programs and failing, through having those, how do we take advantage of that? How do we take advantage of folks that could dissect a schedule eight ways to Tuesday and tell you the interplay of different, different pieces and why this is important and why this is missing and so forth? How do we get that knowledge? Because I think that's the specifics you're talking about. I think SSC has started this. Um, they've started a lot of training with a, a couple of folks to try and build small cohorts to go through this. I think there's a lot more to be done, to be honest. Um, I, I know SDA talks a little bit about how do they teach the prolifer proliferated architecture and what does it mean to do production at scale. Um, again, I, I think some of that's going to be through moving folks around. I don't know that we've come up with a single best way to train everybody on everything. Um, it's probably the area we're going to have to work on in the coming years, to be honest. Um, I know it's not the satisfying answer, but it's kind of where we are today. Ma'am. Um, my name is Lori Cush. Um, I am new to Space Force. I'm retired Air Force. New to Space Thank Force. You crossing over. <laughs> and I accepted a position with. Uh, under Starcom, Delta 10, OLB Wargaming. Okay. So to what you were speaking about earlier, about sharing uh, what we have, our experiences, and our knowledge, that's what I see in a war game. I went to my first capstone a few months ago, and that's exactly what I saw. Um, but from my old Air Force days, where... I saw a gap where I, I couldn't figure it out was how do we resolve security in the Space Force, not just by a name, but physical security acquisitions, um, our personnel security. We have an idea. I just don't know that we have it defined very well. Um, and for me, that's a little concerning, especially since our war games are coalition-based or we bring in our commercial and civil partners. So can you just talk a little bit of that? Yeah. Um, security has been, is, is the challenge, we, is one of the challenges we need to overcome. Um, I, I don't know how else to say it. We have struggled mightily to try and do exactly what you're saying, right? But that's a culture thing as well, right? To, how do I set things at the right security level when we start, right? How do I set it at a yes form or a it's only secret or, right? Trust me, I've been a part of many, many meetings that we classify at multiple SAPs for nothing reason other than I don't want him there, right? If, if it's at this SAP, they can't come and therefore we can have this. Trust me, the Pentagon is full of those conversations. And, 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 and so I'll tell you one of Honorable Calvelli's pushes is, is he keeps asking, why do we have SAPs? Why isn't everything just a TSSCI we need to know? Um, it's a different way of doing it. It's a different way of attacking the problem. Um, there, was a, there was an effort for SAP reform along the same lines, special access program reform in the Pentagon, led by the Deputy Secretary of Defense. It was supposed to have been done last year. It's still... I envision it'll just kind of move deck chairs, to be honest, and they'll, they'll say success as they drop the number of caveats, but they still keep the same things, right? Um, sorry. Uh, 
so we're, we're, we're pushing on and, and, and we're really pushing on the, the, the OSD staff to try and help us with this. Now that's not promising for you guys who are on the day fighting it. Um, where I thought you were going to go with the question was not a security question, but how do I get to the reps and sets in the acquisition world, right? You talked about wargaming, and I'm going to riff for just a second on that. As you talk about wargaming and in the ops world, you guys are known, we're known for playing a scenario out and then debriefing it and having a conversation, what happened, where'd it go? In the acquisition world, our problem is our scenario, our real world thing, takes months to play its way out, right? As we build and we pull things in. How do we get through a timeline faster that we can see what the outcomes are in there? Part of that is this revolution in satellite production of more and more things. Part of it is the digital conversation. And, and forgive me for a moment for being a little science fiction, but I think we've got to get to Jarvis. I think we've got to get to a world where we, the acquirers, sit down with the operators as we build this system and figure out what it is we need it to do. We put a model out there and we say, okay, this is what we think you need it to do. And oh, by the way, industry, when you bid back, right? I need, typically I want a cost volume and a tech volume, right? Are the two things we want back. And, and you guys give us however many pages we tell you you're, you're allowed for the tech volume. And we sit there and we spend hours trying to figure out what it means. And so where I think we need to go is I think we need to go, that tech volume is give us your digital model back, right? And give it to us in the, the proper formats and, and languages that we can, we can talk. And then for cost, it's not about giving me a cost volume. It's about giving me the data sheets to build the cost estimate that CAPE uses and do a cost realism conversation, not a, hey, if I underscore this or I only bid a level three engineer in this part instead of a level four that I really need, I'll save money, da, 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 da but have a cost realism conversation. But if you take that, that tech digital model and then we evaluate those in our scenarios, if you will, and can then figure out where we wanna go, I think as we pick the winner, we then build that model and that becomes our design entity for the preliminary design review, for the critical design review. And then it becomes what we can build our training scenarios and, and, and start modeling the broader system on. Right? And then we build it, and as we build it, we're checking it against what we've built. Right? Uh, if you've had the chance at, up at Lockheed, not to phone anybody, but they have their, their chill that they call, right? And put on the 3D glasses, you can see the satellite and where things are supposed to go. My problem with that is all you're doing is you put on the glasses and you stare at the thing and go, yep, that wire's in the right place. Check, see, boom. But we're not building that in an automated way. It's still work to go. And, and so we use that model then to lead into our production. And then when that becomes the cycle, I think that's where we got to get to get to our reps and sets because then we can start playing with, okay, what if we made this change? How long would that take? What would it do? Boom, 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 boom. We'd see that play out. Um, so I think that's the second piece to the question you didn't ask, if I, if I could. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to the chief first. Sorry, chief wins. Uh, <laughs> Sir, with our service, can you talk about building the culture and breaking away in what the Space Force that's currently built out 50-50 enlisted officer? And we look at what we're trying to get after in the Space Force. What are your thoughts on the potential development of an enlisted acquisition track? Our guardians are much the, – the caliber of guardians we're bringing into the service right now, it's incredible. We've seen that at BMT. And they're getting after those hard problems that General Raymond said, right, we're trying to solve. So just curious on your thoughts on that, sir, especially as we're trying to define what is truly O-work and E-work, especially in those, you know, coming off an ops floor. Right. And, and um, when we talk about retention, um, do you feel that this opportunity in presenting an opportunity like this would reinforce commitment back to our service and retention, or would it drive a further divide in um, separation? First off, let me answer the big question. Absolutely bring it. All right. I am, I'm a huge champion of, of, of trying to do something. Um, one of my SPO tours, I, I did have a couple enlisted folks, and they were phenomenal at a very highly skilled set that we needed at the time. Um, I think there is opportunity there, right? I think there is a lot of things that our enlisted force has as knowledge and skills that we're not taking advantage of. And to quote someone else on it who used it in terms of a a gender conversation, but I'll use it this in the O&E conversation. Why would I want to leave half of my talent pool behind? Okay, so bring it. Let's go. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Okay, um, I think there's a lot that we could do there. I think there's a lot of opportunity. And as you said, I think it offers ways to create where we want to go even better, right? Because 
there is a lot of experience that our east side brings from their operations time. And there is a lot of knowledge that they bring that could help us understand where we're building things. I think they would also benefit by then being able to take some of that back. So they come over, do a SPO tour, and they understand what's being built. And then they can talk to their teammates as they develop requirements for future systems and help figure out the pathway back and forth. But I'm absolutely in favor of it, and, and I'd, I'd be the biggest supporter and cheerleader. Sir. Hey, sir. Uh, Jeff Barnett from Barnett Engineering and Signaling Laboratories. I want to go back to a comment you made a minute ago about maybe we should have, when we issue RFPs, maybe we should have, instead of like a tech volume, have them deliver the digital copy or whatever, you, you know. Uh, those things are expensive, right, to develop. And so as a small business owner, I'm just curious about your thoughts in how the small business community that, that certainly don't have the deep pockets like a Lockheed Martin, Boeing, or Northrop Grumman, you know, uh, what's our role in that? So a couple, a couple different thoughts, Ron. One, I think, I think a lot of those companies, um, it's going to sound a little biased here perhaps, but I think a lot of those companies as they play with the bigger primes will pull off knowledge, one. And two, I think the government, as we define how we want it back, how we want the model back, right, should set the parameters such that we can take things that are developed that aren't picture perfect, if you will, or are, I, I think, I honestly think that people who develop space systems are savvy enough to figure out how to build a model. The question is, can we get it in the right format that we all can understand and see how it plays? Um, I think there's opportunity there. That's, I guess, best I give you at the moment, Jeff. All right, this side of the room has been really quiet. Sir. Thank you for your remarks, sir. Uh, Keith Coble, Terran Orbital. Um, so part of SDA secret sauce to go fast is embracing what was old, which is new now, which is spiral development. Being able to lay out uh, MVPs and then be able to inject new technology from r &E or commercial into those capabilities with uh, follow on launches. Um, they're moving away from, so he moved away from the classic waterfall mm -hmm. program of record model. And as I look at a number of the major acquisitions coming down the pipeline, I'm still seeing the classic program of record waterfall, spend years to get after it, get it on orbit, where the threat is moving much faster. And I think that maybe we ought to take some lessons learned from that. And I'm curious as to how your office is going to start embracing that or what the, the plan is going forward, sir. Okay. Uh, so a couple quick thoughts. Um, I'm a huge fan of where they've been going in terms of their development. Uh, as a program manager, we're always taught uh, there's three things, cost, schedule, performance, pick two, right? Good, fast, cheap, pick two, right? And, and one of the things that SDA has done really well is they have actually traded performance for schedule, right? They have made schedule their king. What we've traditionally done in our acquisition systems have made performance the king. And anytime anything came up, if I couldn't make it, I would go back and go, well, but the requirement is X, Y, Z, right? So a lot of that naturally trends then to a requirements conversation and where they've benefited from essentially not having codified requirements, right? They get to work through their warfighter council to set what they claim they're going to go after and set their MVPs. Um, and work with inside of a construct of a larger CDD, if you will, for missile warning is, is an example, but allows them to do that, that spiral. Second, it's a mindset, right? I, I think a lot of our program managers have been trained in that performance is always king. Um, and we're not, we're not produ producing at a scale, right, that allows you to go, right, where, as fast as you need to. Even a GPS satellite, again, my beloved GPS, takes about six years to build the way we do it right now. Um, and I always got in trouble for why does it take so long? Well, there's, you know, there's an atomic clock. And, and I don't know if you've followed atomic clocks, but there's one guy in New Jersey who makes atomic clocks. He's 78 years old. It's a science. If you want to talk to, about how important that is, go talk to Europe in the Galileo system when they had their failure or the Indians that had their failure in clocks, right? Um, so some of that is lead time of tech. Other that is, other times it's um, what, what the SDA crowd has done is take tech that's available, 
and, and you see that in uh, Cavalli's formula, you see that in his tenants. Use the tech that exists today. So for his missile warning, missile track, he's not out there trying to build new sensors. He's not trying to push the envelope. He's trying to say, what's out there today that I can use? And that's part of where we have to get to. We have a culture in the government and in industry to want to build new. We want that. The engineer in us wants that. Oh, uh, I, can, I can get one more steridian per kilowatt. Da, 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 da. Oh, look how cool this is going to be. And we want to go there. And, and, and when industry proposes it to us, oh, we're, we're ready. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But we've got we've to have that conversation, right? I think when you're on a time scale that, that SDA has been on for every couple of years for launches, you're allowed that. I, I liken this to, to the phone. I don't have my phone on me. I left it so I didn't ring. But, you know, the iPhone, everyone talks about, oh, the iPhone 14, right? Oh, that's great. Look at how quick that came out after the iPhone 13. It actually takes them about six to seven years to build an iPhone from scratch to up. They just have multiple lines in development at the same time, right? So that's one of the benefits that they have is they have the multiple lines can move that. We've tried that on some other programs. We haven't been as successful, but we need to get there. And I think that's part of what Honorable Cavalli's formula is all about. Yes, sir. So if I could have a follow-up. So um, that, that pipeline, that pipeline of capability where you're rolling out on tranches for SDA, for instance, um, I think a lot of that uh, potentially is being fed on the back end by uh, r and &E and the labs. And, and I'm curious about the synchronization um, to get after bringing that new technology into those on-orbit capabilities rapidly, because the, the adversary does have a vote. Um, how how uh, are you synchronizing the acquisition of those actual capabilities with the uh, ingestion of new capabilities to enhance the on-orbit that we're already putting up? Okay, a couple thoughts. First off, I forgot to mention, you know, SSC is doing some of that that spin too with their um, MEO missile warning epics, right? Um, and so I don't want to I don't want to think that it's only one place that's doing that as we talk about cultures. Um, it, but you're really asking about the tech infusion, um, and I think this gets into a conversation that Ms. Vaughn and I have had a lot about how do we in, in, infuse tech, how do we understand what's out there, and how do we get it across the divide? Uh, we have great entities like SpaceWorks and the AFRL that that want to want to build their tech, and, and trust me, they want to build their tech there. They really do, and they get they get excited about every little you know kilowatt per steridian or every you know picosecond on a on a clock. Um, but somewhere we've got to we've got to have a push to pull that across, right? And 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 we're trying to figure out what are some of the best ways to incentivize program managers to do that, incentivize the PEOs to do that. What are the best ways to set up budget that that allow that? One of the things we don't talk about is what if we didn't do it budget everything as a program of record. What if we budgeted, say, ENT, right? right? But I think what you'll see in one of the committee's marks coming out is they're going to ask for a study on that, right? And they're going to ask for a study. Say, okay, you want to you do it by capabilities? But I want to capture everything that's a capability. I want you to break down the rdt &E, the procurement, the o &M, the manpower, all the different lines, and, and, and give it to me as a separate exhibit. Um, I think we'll see that come out this year. So that's, that's one way to, to start driving it. I forgot where I was going with the second part, so I, I think I'll wrap there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right, I'm going to start calling on you know Sergeant Reardon, who's hiding in the back row there. You got one for me? Would, would you guys would Delta Ten just come out in force? Is that? Did you guys decide today that today's meeting is going to be held here? We're happy to be here, sir. Um, still fairly new to space, still learning uh, cyber background in the Air Force for, for 12 years and two years with Delta 10. Um, so you talked about culture, uh, talked about coffee, asked about risk tolerance and, and everything like that. Uh, you talked about building culture through feedback. So right now we have uh, an evaluation system that is tied intrinsically to feedback uh, as, a, as a service. That's how, we, uh, that's how we put it out and that's how we advertise it. Uh, is there any tolerance for separating those two, and, uh, and would that work better for us uh, as a service? All right. You caught my comment about the 724 as a worthless piece of document, right? Um, I think intrinsically we're going to keep the, the feedback tied in the performance report, but to me that's like the minimum standard talk conversation to – 
and and we we the the royal we feel that's important because it forces us gives us good feeling that that feedback actually happened at some point. What I want to see is you know you guys go through a sim and you sit down and you talk about what happened or you go through come to a meeting like this. You're gonna go out to we'll have lunch here, but tomorrow you'll sit down in your in your cubicles and you'll start talking. Hey, what'd you get out of this? Did General Whitney say anything that was relevant? Right? Have that conversation. Right? Have the you know well what'd you think of this? Right? As as a, as as you have your young troops right and and they do a task, ask them. Okay, you did this. Why'd you do it this way instead of this way? What did the TO say? Right? Why why did you go differently? Maybe it's better. Maybe they found a shortcut, right? Maybe maybe they're just being lazy. I don't know, right? But have those talk conversations as well. And that's the feedback that I'm really talking about. And I think inherently it has to be separate from the, the evaluation system. Because if you put that feedback into the evaluation system, um, well, you ask anybody who's been through a, you know, a major debrief on a, on a scenario or a war game, if that was your feedback for your performance report, I don't think there'd be many of us left. We'd all go, man, I suck. I'm, I'm done, right? But if you're truly in, engaging in a culture of learning, you're willing to have that. The other piece of that, what that conversation does, and we talk about this a little bit up front, I did, but it builds a culture of trust, right? Having those conversations, having those talks builds that trust between the work cell, the, the teammates, the, you start to understand what you're doing. And, and, and when you see how it's used, that feedback session is used, you start to go, okay, no, they really are about my development. And so then when you want to have the tough conversation about, hey, I'm sorry, you got to go to Thule, right? Or whatever it is, it's an easier conversation because you've built that trust. So I know it's not the right answer you wanted, I'm sure, but <laughs> thanks. And thanks for letting me put you on the spot. So Senior Williams from uh, Seven Stops. As we talk about uh, rapidly changing Um, hang on a sec. <laughs> I uh, change fatigue is real. First off, let me acknowledge that. Um, and I, and I jokingly hand the, the mic to Chief Fraser there, but uh, I would just point out the SSC crowd. Or if, I, if you want to go from SMC 1.0 in 2017, was it 2018, where we were, to 2.0 in 2018, to something else, to something else, to, to now, right? And I think you're on the third or fourth iteration of what SSC is. That's change fatigue. That's real. At the same time, I give huge credits to the team out there for still delivering the mission, right? To, to being able to put aside. I think we as leaders need to acknowledge that there's a price when we do changes. And that ought to be weighed as to why we're doing this and what we're doing. Um, the other thing I'll tell you that you need to benefit from is, and I'm a huge fan of, of a, an old book by John Cotter on leading change, right? And, and if you ever want to read that book, he's got a great eight-step process, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's got a process. Read the first chapter, get rid of the rest of the book. But the first chapter lays it out. But you've got to do change with a sense of urgency and get it done. And you've got to celebrate when it gets done. And you got to celebrate the achievements to try and combat that that change fatigue. Um, I'll just call out: we went through a major change on the air staff about a year and a half ago, when we stood up what is now SQ, our, my organization. We merged two organizations that were culturally opposed to each other, for lack of better words, if I could say it politely, between uh, the AQ space side and the space policy side, and we merged those into one organization. We leveraged uh, the Secretary of the Air Force. He's a great change agent at times. And I had him sign out a letter saying, these are the things you have to do, and these are the dates they're due. And they were really short dates. And everyone's like, uh, uh, we can't do that. Like, no, 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 no. This, this, this is our tool as well. Because we walked around, we'd get the, well, the OCR is going to take too long. No, no, no. I'm going to walk over to AA and go, hey, the Secretary said, help me, right? So how do you get through the change faster to get out of that? Um, that'd be my second point to you. So celebrate the, when it goes and then, um, do an, do an evaluation of when you need to do it and then get through it as quickly as possible. Best I can offer at this point. Fair. All right, Ed, how are we doing on time? Good. Enough for one more. Sir. All right.
Colbert from Boeing Mission Operations. And it, tying in your title there, evolving talent, cultural implications, okay. all right. retention. It, it's all down to the, the dollar remark you started with. I think both sides are on a workforce demand with the advent of person, all the acquisitions going on. And even if it's just RFIs and, and ideas, multiple companies have thousands of recs trying to find people to do these things and we try to go fast then you have a more and more inexperienced acquisition force that it appears in a training scenario what's your perspective on that challenge which is two i believe uh one i agree with you it is a huge challenge two i agree that it is definitely two-sided um, we have a problem on the government side making sure we've got properly trained individuals to engage and make sure i've got enough of them and, and I know industry has tons of wrecks out there. And, and I know when we do things like operational imperatives and we flood the system with these massive amounts of RFIs on anything possible and then ask for a 30 day turn. I think we gave you 30. We might've given you 15. Um, yeah, 15. Okay. Yeah. It, that doesn't help the situation, nor does this, uh, this push to start a whole bunch of new programs, right? Cause everyone wants to get in on that. I think we're going to see a settling a little bit for a while. In terms of those numbers, I think there's going to be there's going to have to be a conversation about how do we engage back and forth between government and industry to maybe have a better understanding. I think places like uh, the Commercial Services Office, led by Rich Nisley, could be a huge help in that. Right, with their new facility at Cosmic, which is right across the street from the Castle facility, the NRO stood up for engagement, and to have maybe reverse industry days as opposed to let me flood you with RFIs, right? Let's sit down and have a conversation. That might be one way I think that we're trying to get after it. And really, how many how many reverse industries? I think fifteen reverse industry days so far. Fifteen or sixteen. So I think that's a I think that's one positive trend. Um, I think we got to figure out how to get to reps and sets on both sides, right? How do how do you guys on the industry deliver faster? How do you take advantage of the production systems? How do you how do you uh, Help us stop the desire for I want I want to build new tech and help us build what's there and, and get those reps and sets up. I think would help. I think we need to be better on our side as well in terms of what we're asking for. Yeah, what one little caveat follow on the that makes it even more complicated. Um, going back to does classification levels, we're all fighting for clear people to do work. So that the more the more grounds we can make on keeping things in the open to get technology moving forward and then go go dark where we need to. Noted. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. Hey, uh, do you have any other questions for me? Or are we? No, sir. We're... Okay, so I, I'm, I sold the mic. I'm not going to let go yet. Absolutely, sir. So these guys got to listen to me for a couple more minutes. Hey, uh, first off, thanks for letting me come out. Um, as I've said many times, and you've heard me joke, any day assigned to the Pentagon, not spent in the Pentagon is a great day. So I love the opportunity to come out to Colorado. Um, I love the opportunity to come out and share with you a few thoughts, but more importantly, I want to take a moment and say thanks. You guys are the future. You guys are what we're building this Space Force for. You're going to take it in steps that this group over here only imagines and hopefully enables you to do, but, but please continue to push forward, all right? Please continue to work together to demand feedback, to demand the conversations happen about development to build the culture that you want, to build a culture where everyone is appreciated and their ideas are matter, right, is hugely important to us. And so thank you for what you're going to do. And, and if there's anything I can do for anyone, um, I am the only Steve Whitney in the global now. Uh, there used to be, jokingly, when Gene and I were on the air staff, there was actually another Steve Whitney. He works services in MWR. And so, but, but feel free to reach out. And if there's anything I can do to help, um, I'd be honored to. And it's my pleasure to serve with and for each of you. Thank you.